seconds. It feels like it has been so long since I sat down to film a book look. Hopefully you guys are all staying safe and healthy and happy. I am super excited. I am going to be reviewing Goblet of Fire by JK Rowling in today's book look. And <laughs> I'm so excited. As I've mentioned before, my two favorites in the Harry Potter series are Goblet of Fire and Prisoner of Azkaban. So I am really, really excited about this one. So I am going to be doing Hufflepuff makeup because this is like the one book in the series where we get great Hufflepuff representation. Now I am not a Hufflepuff, but I have a <laughs> fairly strong Hufflepuff secondary. My sister is a Hufflepuffy Hufflepuff. And <laughs> so <laughs> I'm excited about this. This will be fun. So let's get started with our super snappy summary. This is the fourth book in the Harry Potter series and it is our halfway point and being the halfway point it is also our transition book so stuff happens in this book. <laughs> we get to see a lot more of like international wizards so we find out about the other schools and there's the Quidditch World Cup that's being hosted in the UK when Harry and the gang get back to school they find out that the school is hosting the Tri-Wizard Tournament which is a very old tournament hosted between Hogwarts, Bubat Bubaton, Bubatons? I'm gonna say Bubaton, <laughs> and Durmstrang which are other wizarding schools in Europe and so Harry and three other students are in the Triwizard Tournament. They go through a bunch of challenges. Harry was mysteriously entered into the Triwizard Tournament as the fourth champion when there are only supposed to be three, one from each school. Harry is forced to compete because it's spellbinding. He and the other Triwizard champions go through this series of events throughout the course of the school year and Harry is also trying to figure out who entered him in this competition and if there is some ulterior darker motive for this. So that is basically the spoiler free version of this. So from this point on there will be spoilers. If that bothers you I will leave a timestamp below for the final look and thoughts summary of my review. If you don't mind spoilers please keep watching that'd be awesome. <laughs> So, as I mentioned, this is one of my favorites. One of the reasons why this is one of my two favorite books is I love a good transition book. I think, you know, there's a lot of series that suffer from like middle book syndrome. The plot kind of lags and, you know, things aren't really happening the way you want them to. This is where a lot of authors just kind of drag. The start's really strong, they know where they're going, but it's kind of that like, well, how do I get to where I'm going kind of thing. And I feel like this book does not suffer from that in the least. It is a super, super strong middle book and I am so happy with it, honestly. <laughs> this book has everything I love about the Harry Potter series. It builds the plot beautifully. It has some of that magic and whimsy. We get to find out more about the rest of the wizarding world and kind of expand on the world a little bit. And it's one of the only times in the entire series that we find out about other wizarding schools and, and how the wizarding world kind of functions outside of the UK. We don't get a ton of that throughout the series so I really appreciate every little bit that we get and of course you know I'm not really talking about those other you know like the tweets that JK Rowling releases after the fact. I don't really count that when I'm taking these reviews into account. I'm talking more about like strictly what's in the book. Basically I love all of that and then like I said this is the transition book. So the first half of the series is all the magic and whimsy. You can tell it's a middle grade book. It's aimed at a little bit younger audience. They deal with some heavier stuff but in, in essence it really is a children's series. It seems like the intention of the kids that are reading the series are kind of growing up with the series. So if you started reading it at the same age as the kids in the book, so 10, 11, 12, you're growing up with the series so by the time you get to the last book in the series you're a late teen early college or basically an adult and so the w tone of the books changes to kind of match that. It gets a lot darker, it gets a lot more gritty and realistic. There's a lot tougher situations that the characters are dealing with in this book. So I believe that this is 
a stunning transition book because you hold on to some of that magic and whimsy while weaving in some of those darker grittier aspects it's specifically in the last portion of the book and I think a lot of it has to do with you can feel that tension building throughout the story you know that something is happening because of the way the book opens but it doesn't really come to fruition until the very end and so you're kind of getting this juxtaposition of tension that you know that something dark is going to happen while in the front we have a lot of this magic and whimsy and you know just these fun events so that's kind of the base reason why I love the book and I'm probably going to keep coming back to that because in essence that really is the heart of why I adore this book I should probably actually start doing my makeup um, or this is gonna turn into another like 45 minute video which we don't want so uh, what am I doing who the heck knows Okay, so this one is also interesting because it breaks the pattern. We've had the pattern of opening with Harry's point of view. So Frank is the caretaker of the old Riddle house and he was, he has been the caretaker since he was much younger and he was still a caretaker when the Riddle family, son, mother, and father, all mysteriously died years and years ago. Now, he was originally under suspicion of their murder, but there was really nothing that they could pin on him, so he remained at the house. And it kind of gives a little bit of foreboding and mystery because it says, you know, the Riddles all, when I say mysteriously died, it was like they seemed like they were in perfectly healthy condition except that they were dead, but they all looked like they were rather shocked or terrified or something of that nature. So Frank, in modern day, very old man, he sees a light on in the Riddle household, thinks there's a bunch of kids in there that are just trying to mess with him. He goes in and he overhears Voldemort, though he doesn't know it's Voldemort and Wormtail, and then he eventually gets caught and killed. I think this is, well, it's definitely not the first instance of the death spell of Ada Kedavra that we see, but it's the first time you kind of see someone present day, just straight up murdered by Voldemort. And so that kind of sets the tone. We end that opening chapter with Harry waking up. He has seen all this as kind of a nightmare. And that kind of sets stuff up for later in the series. We don't see it quite as much with this book. He just kind of gets that one thing. But it, it is set up throughout the series that Harry has this connection to Voldemort, obviously. And a lot of times when Voldemort or something bad is going on, his scar will hurt. And so he freaks out because he had this dream. He doesn't really remember it once he wakes up. But he remembers enough and his scar hurts enough that he decides to send a message to Sirius asking for help. So he does that and so he is spending the last bit of the summer with the Weasleys. They are going to the Quidditch World Cup and Mr. Weasley has managed to score very good seats because he, you know, works at the ministry. So that section, that whole section is really just a lot of fun. There's uh, some good, obviously there's some good setup for the rest, but when you're first reading that section, it just reads like a lot of fun. You know, there's this thing with Voldemort maybe going on and you know that Voldemort's planning something to harm Harry, but you're not quite sure what. And so you're just kind of, you're just kind of waiting. But in the meantime, you kind of get lulled into the sense of, you know, just that traditional wizarding fun because, you know, the Quidditch tournament's happening and everyone's excited and cheering and happy. And it's between Bulgaria and Ireland. So, you know, everyone's excited. And <laughs> the Weasley twins are interesting in that section because everyone's, you know, kind of placing bets. And so the Weasley twins are like, well, we bet that Bulgaria will catch the snitch, but Ireland will win the match, which is kind of like a crazy thing to bet but then it ends up happening. Bulgaria has Victor Crumb, who's this really famous Quidditch player. He's really young. He's like the best seeker in it ever. It's amazing. But Ireland just has a slightly stronger team, so they come through. It's great. And then, you know, kind of, not out of nowhere, but after all of that, you know, they're all kind of just celebrating. Everyone's super excited. And I mean, if you've ever been to kind of a big sporting event you know that kind of rush after the fact is you know I think it's portrayed pretty well or even if you know just a large event in general 
I think that that's pretty much pretty well captured, you know, everyone's basically spent all of their energy just cheering on their favorite team and you know everyone's tired and happy and there is just kind of this lulled surreal sense just pervading everything and I think that's captured really well and then in the midst of that all of a sudden there's just panic and chaos because there's just this outburst of Death Eaters. I can't remember if, I, I'm pretty sure like we've kind of seen them, seen them mention they're Voldemort's followers. You know, they're saying, well, they're probably just drunk and just came out to, you know, scare some people and da 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 da, but there's still panic and chaos and they were tormenting the Muggle family that owned the land that the wizards were staying on and it was all just, it was kind of crazy and everyone's running and tents are on fire. And then all of a sudden the dark mark gets sent up in the sky, which is of course Voldemort's sign. And that freaks people out even more. And so Barty Crouch, who is a wizard who works at the ministry, uh, shows up and he is furious and they find out it was Harry's wand because Harry lost his wand and he wasn't sure how but he his wand that was used to cast the dark mark and they're like Barty Crouch is kind of on the warpath and they're like heck this is Harry Potter when he didn't set off this mark you should know better so he's like yes yes of course and they you know Winky who is Crouch's house elf is there and he yells at her because she didn't stay in the tent to get trampled and so he dismisses her which infuriates Hermione and like I said it's just kind of chaos no one really knows what's happening and they have a mess to clean up and it just kind of puts this whole giant damper on like on the situation so so while all of that is going on I feel like this isn't as sorry this looks much more even in my further mirror than it did once I looked at the up close mirror and I was like oh crap that's not actually as even as I thought it was so all of this happens and then you know but they're trying to say oh you know we'll we'll figure it out it's no big deal just you know there's something exciting that's gonna happen at Hogwarts this year and they ship them off to Hogwarts and they're like we'll deal with it later and Harry's even more set off because of all of this because you know, he knows something like Voldemort's up to something and he hasn't heard back from Sirius yet and he's kind of he's kind of scared they get to Hogwarts and they find out you know, they find out what's happening and it's this Triwizard tournament that I mentioned earlier and they also get a new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher because of course Lupin my boy left after last year. Dumbledore called in an old favor from famous R. Had I Moody who is known for being exceptionally good R but a little paranoid. So Man I Moody shows up lives up to his name. Constant vigilance! Constant vigilance! <laughs> and <laughs> And he just, he's kind of wacky, a little, oh, not a little, very intense. And at the same time, he, you know, kind of takes Harry under his wing a little bit. Not nearly as much as Remus did, but I mean, no one can live up to Remus. Then they're announcing the Triwizard Champions. And so Cedric Diggory, a Hufflepuff, is chosen as the Hogwarts Champion. Fleur Delacour is chosen as the Bubatons Champion. And... Victor Crumb is chosen as the Durmstrang champion and of course you know Victor Crumb everyone freaks out because he's a famous Quidditch player. He's a pretty big deal. So all this stuff is happening and then out spits a name. Wouldn't you know it? It's Harry Potter. And then Dumbledore calmly walks up to Harry and says, Harry did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Not Harry did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Oh my gosh I can't, can't freaking take that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? Uh, Harry has no idea who put his name in the goblet. He's like, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, and no one believes him. And this causes some tension between him and Ron. So, and this tension lasts a decent amount of time in the book. Like last year, it was Ron and Hermione that had a falling out because of Hermione's cat. And this year, it's Ron and Harry. And Harry feels very much alone because everyone's mad at him for, you know, they think purposefully circumventing the rules and they, they think he basically just wants attention and no one believes him when he says he didn't put his name in the Goblet of Fire and this gets worse because there's this no good journalist named Rita Skeeter that is, you know, making, <laughs> making things worse, trying to paint him as this 
like poor lost soul and then when he doesn't comply with her then she like turns it around on him and he's like he's a nasty little creature and then poor Hermione gets roped into it because Victor Crumb likes Hermione like there's all this stuff going on and Rita Skeeter writes an article about Harry and Hermione and everyone turns on Hermione and starts sending her like all these like howlers and terrible stuff someone sent her like an envelope with undiluted boober tuber posts in it which like terribly burned her and you now Snape being the trash human being that he is like read out loud this article about Harry and Hermione in class to like harass them which <clears throat> And so Harry, you know, in addition to being kind of terrified about what's what on earth is going to happen with the whole tournament, because, you know, it's supposed to be for pretty much advanced wizarding students only. And he got his name thrown in and he doesn't know what's happening. So again, I mentioned that Moody kind of took him under wing and it was like trying to help him. Says, you know, well, you know, someone may be trying to hurt you by putting you into this and we'll just have to protect you and da 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 da. And so, like I said, Harry, Harry's having a rough time and it's made worse by the fact that Ron is not on his side. And it's, it's really sad to watch because you're just like, you feel so bad for him because, you know, like the one person he can usually count on is Ron and now he doesn't even have Ron. He's just kind of, he's just kind of stuck and no one believes him and everyone's tormenting him. And, you know, the Hufflepuffs are usually nice, but they're mad because kind of their one moment of glory is stolen and Malfoy's capitalizing off of it and you know making Potter stinks tokens and you know Harry's always like a little wound type ball of stress anyway so it's it's just a mess for him like I said Mad-Eye Moody is kind of it's just an interesting character in general and he does this defense against the dark arts lesson where he teaches about the unforgivable curses and then demonstrates them like on spiders I should not have raised my eyebrows while I put concealer around them but whatever Whoops. It's a very sobering lesson for the kids. You know, they kind of have fun with the imperious curse because, you know, it puts people under their control. And so he makes the spider do a jig and everything, but then talks about how terrible it was. And, you know, people under Voldemort, you know, were often claiming the imperious curse. And then he shows the Cruciatus curse and Neville kind of volunteers this one and seems very, very sobered and seems very very disturbed seeing this one in action and so after the lesson Moody actually takes him for tea and tries to make him feel a little better just pretty sweet to him and then you know of course he does the most unforgivable curse of all which is Avada Kedavra all of that happens and it, it just kind of sets up a lot of stuff for later like you see this one lesson you see that Moody is a he's a good, he's a good data teacher and makes it sound like he's a good dad so he's a good defense against the dark arts teacher Yo, I don't even know what I'm doing. Where, where is my mascara gone? Where, where can it be? It's hiding somewhere in the deep beyond. Where, where can it be? The first part of the book just kind of, it sets up so much for the last half of the book. And what I find interesting about it is just, you know, just that. You get this kind of sense of something's going to happen, but you're kind of lulled into the sense of, well, how is Harry going to manage the goblet tasks? And, you know, he finds out what the first one is with a little help from Hagrid. The tournament, the tasks are fun and I like seeing them. And Cedric Diggory, I mean, he's a very noble character. I just love seeing how the characters help each other throughout the tasks. So like in the first task, Harry finds out with a little help from Hagrid what the first task is going to be ahead of time. And then of course, you know, the other two competitors also find out from the other schools. And so Harry's like, well, it's not fair that only Cedric should be in the dark. So he makes sure that Cedric knows and you just kind of see his nobility like you see his sense of fairness and just wanting to help others and I think you know it's really great that we see that come through of course I mean we already knew this about Harry he's a great character he's a good person but it's nice to see it just come through even more and then in the second task you also see this people that the champions love are taken and held underwater and they only have an hour to retrieve them and Harry actually manages to get there first and he stays underwater making sure that every champion gets to their person and Floor actually didn't manage to get there in time so he waits until the last possible second and then comes up with Floor's little sister and Ron you know so he would have been 
last but he wanted to make sure that everyone was taken care of. And again, it just shows his character. He's actually rewarded for that because then the Mer people come up and they tell Dumbledore what happened and so then he ties for first and so you kind of actually see Harry beginning to succeed in this. Oh wait, I was gonna do my... I'm gonna do my liner. I like almost didn't want to do an eyeliner look with this one because I was like it kind of defeats this like fun little... Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I kind of feel like I need more of the yellow gold in there so I'm gonna... Do I know? Hold on, which one matches my shirt best? That one. That was a little bit. I just didn't want it to look too off for my shirt because I hate not matching my colors. It just bothers me. <laughs> but I almost didn't want to do like a winged eyeliner, but I wanted to get the black in there somehow. Because you know the, the Hufflepuff colors are yellow and black, so... And I, I can't just have my mascara. So I'm gonna do like a... I'm gonna do a little bit like I'm gonna do a little bit of black liner and try not to take away from like the fun sunny vibes <coughs> it's fine definitely didn't knock anything over it's chill close enough oh my goodness why is it is this darker than I, that's darker than I remember <laughs> oh my gosh okay we're we're going very sunny today I've been inside for so long I should have gone with my palest bronzer we can go with like a nice dusted sort of oh my gosh please ignore the literal brown forehead cool gonna get everywhere the sun hits because apparently this is what we're doing with the bronzer today we are going for that i'm a hard working huff puff in the sun vibe and we're pretending that your girl can tan which she absolutely cannot <laughs> do not worry we will be using powder to blend this out and like i said you know we see we see this nobility also in Cedric, which is really cool. You know, he makes sure that he also helps Harry out with the second task after he can't figure it out. You just see a lot of this really good character interactions, even after they're kind of cast in these roles as not enemies, but competitors. And you still see them interacting well with, it, with each other and helping each other out, which I think is really cool. Okay, so we have a crowd set of bronzer on, which is cool, cool. I'm gonna try and make myself not look like a toasted marshmallow. Or maybe that's the goal. Do I want to look like a toasted marshmallow? I don't think I do. I want to look sun-kissed. I feel like I need to add freckles. Am I gonna add freckles? I'm gonna add freckles. Okay. <laughs> okay, while I'm adding freckles to my face, because this will take a hot second. Well, we're gonna talk about the twist in the ending. So the final task is like a maze. Whoever reaches the Triwizard Cup first and grabs it after going through this maze, which is set up with a bunch of traps and stuff, is the winner. And so Cedric and Harry were tied, so they got a head start and they end up reaching it at about the same time. And Harry says, well, let's get it together. There's no reason why we can't. It's still a Hogwarts victory either way. And so they reach together and they're instantly transported to this random graveyard because it's it's a port key. So this port key, they discover Wormtail and Voldemort. Voldemort is trying to return to power, of course, and he kills Cedric, which is heartbreaking. And it's kind of this, it's a dramatic change of pace. And, you know, the everything's kind of happening all at once. All of the Death Eaters come and Voldemort takes Harry's blood and they bring him back and it's just, it's crazy and terrifying. Basically, Voldy's like, hey, fight me like a man and gives him his wand so he can fight him. Am I having too many freckles? Nah, let's add more. We're layering freckles. They start to duel and because Harry's wand is Voldemort's wand's twin, they can't really fight each other and all of a sudden there's like a dome and they can't they can't really break the, the hold on the wand and everyone that's been killed by Voldemort's wand comes out in these kind of ghostly figures from Cedric all the way back to Harry's parents. And they kind of overpower Voldemort long enough for Harry to grab Cedric's body in the port key and escape back to Hogwarts. But now Voldemort is risen and Cedric is dead and no one really believes Harry anymore and it's it's all kind of crazy. It's it's just this it's this big terrible moment because you know no one really expected it to go quite as wrong as it did. And then you know of course the Diggories are absolutely gutted to discover that their their, their son is dead and and so then Moody shows up, he takes Harry back, and then he reveals that he is actually Barty Crouch Jr., who was a Death Eater, and he 
escaped and it's I don't know it's it's all just kind of crazy he's revealed all of this stuff y'all I'm so bad at explaining this and it's like my favorite book I, I can't explain the reveal better than it was done because it was built up so well and you know you get all of these clues about why Barty is the way he is, what happened between him and his father, what happened, you know, to kind of like help him escape, and how he's been building up this whole year to deliver Harry to Voldemort. And of course Dumbledore shows up at the last second. They save Harry from certain demise again. They find the real Mad-Eye Moody who's been locked in a trunk because uh, Barty Crouch Jr. has been using Polyjuice Potion all year to disguise himself and keeps the real one locked in a box. Do your skip freckles? I'm gonna pretend I do. There's <laughs> so many freaking freckles! I swear I'm gonna be done soon. I just, this is addicting, I can't stop. pencils for eyebrows anymore. I use them for freckles. Anyway, I'm just here to tell you that the build in Goblet of Fire and the dramatic reveal and all of the red herrings that Barty Crouch set up were just wonderful and glorious. I love how Hermione is kind of on a warpath the whole book, which I mean that's like that's a whole other thing. This is when she starts spew, which is the I can't even remember what spew stands for anymore. It's it's something to do with house elf liberation. And the house elves are like mad at her the whole book because they like the status quo. And she's also on a warpath against Trita Skeeter because of all the dramatic nonsense that she's doing the whole book. And then she ends up one of my prime moments of saying that Hermione is such a Gryffindor is at the very end of the book she keeps Rita Skeeter in a jar because they can't figure out through the entire book how Rita Skeeter is getting all of this all of this like basically like classified secret information and end up finding out that she's an unregistered animagus who turns herself into a beetle. Hermione captures her in a jar and makes her promise that she won't write anything for a whole year before she'll let her out which is kind of great and amazing. <sighs> Yo I don't even know what I want to talk about I just love everything about it. I love seeing Ron's more jealous aspects and then how quickly he apologizes and is just as loyal to Harry as before. It, it just makes me so happy. I cannot explain to you how well this reveal is done because every like like you've seen me fumble with this video like every time I'm trying to talk about it I'm just failing so epically. I was gonna do like a liquid blush but I'm thinking that's not the smartest idea now that I've added freckles. I'm gonna do a powder blush because that seems safer. Please go read this book if you have not. Please go reread it if you've already read it. It's like everything about it is so good. I love seeing vengeful Hermione. I love seeing our female characters get flaws. I and that is probably one of her most notable flaws is just that she can be very brash and vengeful. She does not do well with injustice and she will like hunt you down and destroy you if she thinks you are being a terrible human being. And <laughs> that is what she does with Rita Skeeter. That is what she does with Spew and she's trying to the house elf's dismay to get their liberation and get them to realize that they are, <laughs> you know, they are worth something. Ooh, that's a lot brighter than I remember. I feel like <laughs> that's too light, I think. I oh, do I have the heck happened on Ah no blend. <laughs> blend, darn you, blend. Have I taken away I've taken away all of the freckles on this one. Dang it. In the in the maze, in that final challenge, it's so real and so dramatic to like the sense of foreboding you get reading the maze section is so real and then it culminates in that First, like that little moment of triumph when Cedric and Harry are both reaching for the Triwizard Cup and you're like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I was wrong, nothing terrible happened. And then, you know, everything goes to crap real fast. Like I said, the Moody reveal is absolutely brilliant. 
And he even sets up the own red herring. He's the first one to suggest that someone might want to kill Harry by putting his name in the goblet. And like, he's the one that wants to kill Harry. It's like you'd think someone would just want, just want everyone to think Harry was a stupid kid who just put his own name in, but Hootie's like, someone's trying to kill him and then like takes responsibility for Harry. And I, I don't know, it's pretty brilliant. That's pretty crazy brilliant. Yeah, it's, it does have a much darker ending though. Or with the books up until this point, you know, there may, there may have been some drama, but up until this point, there's always been kind of a sense of hope at the end. And this one, I mean, it, heaven's sake, it ends with Cedric dying and the school is absolutely rocked. Like there's no, there's nothing good about that. And, and it's just, it's such a dark, dark reveal. That ending just kind of, ooh, ooh, that's way too pink. Ah, I forgot how pink that goes. Crap. You immediately sense the shift in tone of the series. Like as soon as, basically as soon as Cedric dies, there's th that shift in tone. And then of course you're also starting to get the sense that the wizarding world's not really going to believe. You know, of course Harry's like, oh, Voldemort's back. And then Cornelius Fudge is like, oh, that's impossible. And basically instantly dismisses him. And you kind of, because that shift in the tone of the series is so fast and so dramatic, you really get this kind of tight sense of, holy crap, stuff is going down really fast. And you understand the gravity of the situation that nothing is going to be the same from this point on because Voldemort is well and truly back. No one believes Harry. There's just this sense of doom and gloom. <laughs> Also contributes to the shift in tone is just the fact that Cedric is the first kid we see die. Before it was kind of abstract. We see bits and pieces of death and of course you know it starts out with you know Harry's Harry's parents have died and all of this stuff so death is kind of followed throughout the series. It doesn't really feel real and significant until this moment. Children are not invincible from this. There is a real very dangerous threat and you can't trust everyone you meet because you know throughout this book Harry has trusted Moody and then Moody turned out not to be Moody. I'm just trying to hurry up so I can do my end review because what, what else can I say other than I love it? Oh I wanted to talk about so I've seen this multiple times but like talking about how the Triwizard Tournament they do the Wizarding World does a terrible job at making this a good spectator sport. Terrible job and I'm just like like kind of in awe of how bad they make this like as that because the first the first challenge with the dragons is the only one that people can actually see and then the second one all takes place under a lake the third one is a giant maze and no one is even raised up to see what's going on in the maze so then people don't know what's happening like if they had had you know kind of like a camera live action thing going they would have been able to see the second that Cedric and Harry disappeared after grabbing the port key. They would have seen it and they didn't because it's stupid. And wizards, like if muggles in in the 90s had the technology to watch live spectator sports, wizards absolutely could have done something better. That's my one gripe with the book is that makes zero sense and it would have it would have made people probably believe Harry a lot faster but can't have people believing Harry now can we? The other thing is, I mean, like I said, I, I already kind of mentioned the relationship tensions and struggles in this book are real. Harry has a crush on Cho Chang and there's everything between Hermione and Crumb. Ooh, I did kind of want to touch on that and I didn't touch on it at all. But yeah, and then everything between like Ron and Harry and then Ron and Hermione. Like Ron's just, Ron's struggling in this book a little bit, <laughs> a lot of it. But yeah, so I did, I did kind of want to talk about that, like, super duper fast. So I love seeing Hermione throughout this book, like I already mentioned, and other people have said it way better than me talking about how arc for Hermione does a lot of good because it builds in kind of a lot of her flaws, but then it also builds in this kind of other aspect of Hermione that we don't really get to see a lot, the side of her that does want to be seen and want to be noticed. And she really does like Crumb, and Crumb likes her 
you know, for her intelligence and her and the fact that she's one of the few girls at the school that's not falling, like falling over herself, like for his autograph or anything. And they go to the Yule Ball together and it's really cute. And Hermione like makes herself up and she like changes herself because she just like wants this one moment to be like, <laughs> she's like, yeah, I'm brilliant. I can be gorgeous too. Who the heck cares? But it's, it's just pretty great overall. And then she gets like mad at Ron for not asking her first. You can see like seeds here for later on in the series, which I mean, if you don't know what's going to happen, you, you don't know yet. But uh, it, it, like a lot of this relationship tension stuff, which I mean, they're 15, there's going to be relationship tension and stuff, but a lot of it gets set up for later. And then like I said, Harry has his crush on Cho Chang, doesn't really come to fruition. A lot of this happens around the Yule Ball. And it, I don't know, it's just pretty great to see. You know, the relationship struggles in this book are real and they, the characters do feel like their age. They feel like teenagers, which is a pretty big accomplishment because I think a lot of adult writers can't really capture that well, but the characters feel realistic and they feel everything that they're going through, you know, has weight to it. You know, even if they're sillier struggles, I think I'm pretty much done, but I'm not super happy with the lips. It feels too orange. So I think I'm going to take it off real quick. I think that is pretty much it. This is the final look. I have kind of a little bit of a uh, like sunny thing going on because you know it's very happy and bright. If it's more Hufflepuff than it does this book because there's really no darkness in this look at all. There's nothing edgy or dramatic. I could have done a bigger wing but I feel like I do a bold winged eyeliner almost every book look and I just wasn't feeling it today. So we have braids and we have lip gloss in our teeth and <laughs> freckles which took way too long to apply and all of that. My final thoughts on the book, like I said, it is one of my two favorites in the Harry Potter series. I absolutely adore it. I think its transition is amazing. It go it perfectly transitions the first whimsical magical half of the series into the darker grittier last half of the series and encompasses both of those in one book really well. I think the dramatic build and reveal and the like the plot twists are done really well. You very much get that sense of darkness and foreboding throughout a lot of the book while also getting some really fun adventures through the Triwizard Tournament and you also get some really realistic teenager relationship struggles with crushes and friend arguments and jealousy and all that stuff so you kind of get a little bit of a lot of different genres in this one book and it's just a perfect blend in my opinion. I think you should absolutely read it if you haven't yet and it should be enough to convince you that helpful puffs actually get a decent amount of <laughs> recognition in this book. It almost never happens. It doesn't really happen again. Helpful puff for the win. <laughs> just read this book please. Do yourselves a favor. Enjoy the magic that is Goblet of Fire. So that's pretty much all I have for today. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you wouldn't mind doing all those YouTuber-ish things of liking and commenting and subscribing, that'd be chill. <laughs> so hopefully you guys will stick around for more book looks to come and hopefully you guys are staying happy and healthy. I hope you all have a magical day. Keep reading, keep creating, keep exploring. There is a lot of magic you can find even if you're locked in your house. Yeah, thank you all so much. I love you so much and I hope you have a beautiful day. Bye!